This is Chris Oatley's ArtCast, episode 87, part two of my interview with character designer Justin Rodriguez. Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Chris Oatley's ArtCast, the show that goes inside the hearts and minds of successful professional artists. I'm Chris Oatley. I was a visual development artist at Disney before I quit to start my own online art school, the Oatley Academy of Concept Art and Illustration. Find more art instruction and career advice from some of the most inspiring voices in animation, games, comics, and new media at chrisoatley.com. Austin Light. Chris Oatley. Welcome to the ArtCast. Good to be here. Thank you for joining me to introduce this episode. Podcasting gets lonely. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to know you better after the Justin Rodriguez interview, but uh, introduce yourself. I am a writer and illustrator, or maybe an illustrator writer, depending on what you read, that was <laughs> in Sarah Marino's uh, first mentorship class. With the Oli Academy. Yes. Yeah. And it was awesome. And then you have an amazing breakthrough story to share with us. And, uh, and, and so you'll be back with Sarah Marino. Yes. After the interview. Justin Rodriguez, of course, uh, on the show today. This is part two of a two-part interview. Have you listened to the first part? Awesome. Yeah, it's yeah, fantastic. It's really good. Got a great response, too. I love that. I love when we get a lot of feedback in the comments. And um, of course, we love those social shares, too. That really helps a lot. Justin provides some further insight into that purgatorial time period between his graduation from college and getting his first gig as a professional artist. Which is what I loved about Justin's story of like, you know, he was hustling, head down, yeah. working hard, and he was like, something's going to come of this. It's, it has to. <laughs> and actually, on that note, uh, by the time we get to the end of this second half of the interview, Justin is talking about how he was working in-house a few days a week at Red Games, and there was a possibility he was going to go full-time. Uh, well, since this recording, he has gone full-time with them, so I should uh, should clarify that. I loved the part where he started talking about style, basically endorsed becoming a uh, art vampire. Right. Um, <laughs> like, I'm so into that. This is what Austin Cleon wrote about in Steel Like an Artist. What we're really talking about is influence. Right? Yeah. What What are your influences? Who has influenced you? You know, you hear those uh, questions all the time. And I think we usually think about that in a in a way that's very accidental. But Austin Cleon and Justin talk about how you can choose. And so Justin offers some advice on how to steal like an artist and still have your work be yours and be, you know, authentic and authorial and awesome. I was trying to think of another auth <laughs> word and I couldn't. <laughs> but that that part and the talk and talking about beginner artists getting tripped up and I got to have a, a style, you know, TM. Right. <laughs> He talks about his two modes for exploring a character design, and then he wraps up with what he believes to be the most important question every aspiring character designer should be asking. And I also want to say that last time, Justin talked about some advice that Brett Bean gave him, and a bunch of you wrote in saying, what was the advice? And you will get your answer in this in this uh, part of the interview, uh, I promise it's in there and it's really good. You can connect with Justin online via his website, justindraws.com. After the show, please go to chrisoatley.com forward slash JR2. That's as in Justin Rodriguez and the number two. And join us for a conversation about what was it again, Austin? A speed bump, an obstacle, a struggle uh, that you encountered in your art and someone else's work, the work of some other artist helped you to overcome that struggle or break through that obstacle or, or 
uh, speed over the speed bump. <laughs> <laughs> That's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it is. You always, you're probably going to hit your head. Okay, so we did Disney Interactive Moderation, six months of portfolio six hardcore. Sadness, unemployment, and yeah. self-doubt, yeah. The six-month ritual pain period. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the, the growing pains, I like to call it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and how, how was that? How was that for you? You know, it's funny, like, um, I look back on it now, and it was rough. I mean, that was probably <laughs> the most self, like, not... <laughs> That was the worst time of my life. No. <laughs> that was artistically probably the most. It's right after you've actually jumped out of the plane. Exactly. And right. You haven't yet opened your parachute. <laughs> exactly. That's, That's awesome. exactly what it was. It's like, oh, wait, this is for real now. <laughs> you know, and if this doesn't happen, what's going to happen after this? And I think I needed that. Yeah. You know, the safety net had to go away for me to really take it seriously enough to get better because I think I was right there I was like right at the cusp of being good enough and then that's what really you know once I had that fear of not being able to pay the rent it was okay like now I have to take this for real seriously and you know get better but it was it was rough but I mean honestly that first year I think I grew artistically so much that it's like, I look back on my old stuff and I'm just like, oh my gosh, like just that whole year, I was like, man, I took this giant leap forward. And it's because I took it seriously for the first time. Like I took it really seriously for the first time. Did you know you were taking it more seriously? Yes, yeah. I knew. And I was totally conscious of it. And I even, I even remember during that time, like, I wish I would have done this oh. years ago. You know, this is how serious I should have been taking it from the get go. Like, I always took it seriously. Like, you know, that's not to say, like, I was just farting around doing whatever. Right, right. I always took it seriously. And I was always, you know, I always feel guilty when I didn't draw enough and all that stuff. But I looked at, I, you know, during that time, even I was like, oh, man, like, this is how seriously I should have been taking it the whole time. And I would have been where I was, like, a lot sooner. One of my students, she's been saving up for a long time and um, she just quit her job and uh, oh, wow. it's taking a year. She and her husband have been saving up so she could do this. And she's one of my painting drama students and she's been talking through it with the group for uh, maybe a month or so. <laughs> and whenever students ask me something that kind of pivotal, yes. uh, I never give them direct advice. I'll just kind of try and do my best to recap yeah. what we've been talking about and encourage them and, and that kind of thing. But it, I don't want to have any part of right. that decision <laughs> for obvious reasons. I'm, I'll be there right with them through the whole right. thing. I will stay in the room with you. But then it's after you've made your decision, then I'll tell you what I really think you should have yeah. done. <laughs> anyway, and, you know, she is an artist who, had I wanted to be irresponsible, I would have said, yeah, I think you should. I think it's time. I think yeah. you're ready. And the point being, being ready for something like that you can kind of rush that and you know forget to buckle your parachute and it flies right. off while you're midair right and so it's like yep. you want to yeah you're still going to jump out of the plane or whatever but you want to make sure that you know it's a reputable company that's flying the plane yeah. and that the, you want to make it through skydiving exactly class. exactly oh, go to the go all the way through the class do you don't the, want to skip out on the part where they where you actually learn how to pull the shoot exactly <laughs> right know? exactly exactly you want to make sure that shoots are tested and all that you know there is a there is a degree of of being careful and again a big part of that I think is you know obviously she was financially prepared as you were too, part of that was from the severance package and then, <laughs> yeah, and then another part of it was from saving. Right. And then also that sort of having voices in your life of people who yeah. you absolutely know, they will tell you no. They will tell you no if they really do believe right. that it's crazy or that you're doing something wrong. And, you know. Anyway. Yeah, now that you bring that up, like, you know, I said, I wish I had done this year sooner, but would it have worked year sooner? Right. You know, was I good enough? You know, like at that point, like, was I at that point to, you know, to really push myself and get to the professional point or, you know, or would I have just fallen flat and then had to take another job, you know? Right. It what, wouldn't what, have been wasted, but, you know. Right. How much knowledge was gained from Silver and Brett Bean and, you know, even the Will West and stuff having time to gestate in your mind and you to work through that and, 
that's why I, I always encourage people who are in the day job that they hate. Yes, I want you out of there. I want, you know, it's like I don't want you to have to be in there. And I encourage people to get just a different day job uh, at times. Yeah. Uh, sometimes yeah, exactly. that's the answer. Just just different is better. Sometimes that's that's change of scenery. Exactly. Yeah. It just helps. You know, new people, they don't take advantage of you anymore because they don't right. know you as well. Like there can be <laughs> there can be all kinds of uh, They'll all take kinds advantage of, when they get to know you. But. Exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, get, you know, it buys you some time. You know, so there yeah. might even be reasons to do that. Um, of course, it's oh, always totally. case specific, but that day job time, that's an important time as well. Yeah. We've all been through. It's when the stuff that you really care about sinks down into your subconscious and you actually start working that way it actually starts showing up in your work as opposed right. to being something that you're chasing after you know it's like yeah. you have to have that time to just do life too so it is a good you know it is a good time you know i grew probably the most during that time you know i say i grew exponentially that first year i think right. the most but you know i wouldn't have been able to grow exponentially had i not had that growth of you know, like you said, life and all yeah, of that stuff. You know, the Disney job was great, you know, like honestly, like it was easy and like pretty well paid. And, you know, I was totally happy there. And I was like, this is where I'll make my final stand. You know, like this is where I will get yeah. better. And then all of a sudden they threw me out of the plane. And then, <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, that that's another thing that kind of helps is where you didn't necessarily decide to jump. Yeah, you did in fact get shoved out of the plane, and you it know, might have been different had I decided to jump. You exactly, know? it might have turned out different. Yeah, yeah. There's something about well, at least you didn't have to live with making that decision. Right. This is the hand that I was dealt, and so right. I'm just going to try my best to turn the negative into a positive, and and use this as portfolio. Uh, yeah. Time. And so, what came next? So after that, I mean, you know, and then it was the in-house gig and the freelance. Job. Oh, right, right, right. The Facebook game. Yeah, and then the Facebook game went under less than a year after that, I think, and then and then it was just freelance since then, you know, like Fisher Price came calling and that was an amazing experience wow. and I got to work with Jose, which is you know, it was like one of my dreams, you yeah, know. He, so he is the he is the best man. Yeah, and it's just really cool. Like it was I was on it from the very beginning and you know, I stayed on it the whole time. So it's like this web series uh, animated series on YouTube, an original property that they created. It's out now, actually called Adventure. So it was it was a lot of fun, and I got to kind of develop the whole look of the thing, like help develop the whole look of the thing. Um, it was a lot of fun. That's cool. And so then, have you been pretty much working on that full time, or have you been doing? Uh, yeah, I worked on that pretty much full time for you know, and then some other freelance gigs, you know, for about a year. That just ended kind of this last summer. And then, you know, it's just a couple of freelance gigs in between there. Did an interactive iPad app that just had a successful Kickstarter, which is cool, for another company. Oh, cool. Uh, What's that called? The company is Mighty Yeti. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I did one of the storybooks for them. And then right now, like, I just got brought into Red Games. They're actually building a, an iOS game. And I'm there. They're talking to me about coming on full time, um, doing concept art. So that's that's really cool. And... I'm kind of the main concept artist on it. So if this game, when this game gets made, because it's actually going to go through, uh, it will pretty much be all me. So Oh, it's so great. The total showcase. Yeah, I'm really excited about this thing. So it's like pretty much all my style and, you know, stuff like that. So it should be really cool. Man, that's cool. And are they in Southern California as well? Yeah, they're in um, Santa Monica. So I actually... Nice. I work in-house there three days a week now because I teach on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I have to work from home Tuesdays and Thursdays so I can get to class um, in the afternoon. Wow. We've circled around this idea of style. It's something that you brought up when we first started talking about this interview. Uh, right. Something that had been on your mind. What about style, Justin Rodriguez? <laughs> I don't like the word style. Yeah, I mean, like, I think style has practical uses. Yeah. Right. Um, think, you know, like Hercules and... Uh, you know, like the Greek mm -hmm. style, like infused in the movie, kind of helps tell the story. You know, style has financial purposes, you know, like flat styles are cheaper to make and flash and all that stuff. But I think personal style is something that especially younger artists are way too concerned with because I don't think that it's I don't think it's a real thing. I don't think it's a tangible thing that you can go like, you know, I'm going to take Chris Oatley's class on how to develop a style. You know, like, <laughs> dang it, scratch that. Right. <laughs> Cancel the style class. <laughs> yeah. 
you can't do that, Chris. Like, that's just taking everything. <laughs> <their brain. laughs> like, um, you know, it's not something that you can learn. I think it's something that's wholly organic. It's basically the way that I always put it to anybody who asks me this is it's all of your influences and your personal life experiences and, and, you know, not just artistic influences, like movie influences, like what kind of movies you like, what kind of music you like, all of this stuff. And it's blended up into your, in your brain. And then it just like comes out your hand. Think of all the traveling that it has to do to get to your hand. And then it, you know, it's just wholly you at the end of that yeah. time, you know, that's something I've felt less threatened on behalf of my students <laughs> to, <laughs> to have them just go copy some styles. Right. Because so you feel less threatened to have them do that? Yes. Okay. As I've become more and more confident in my agreement with what you're saying here, you know, we, right. we have very similar thoughts on, on style. As I become more confident and more convinced of that, I'm now more liberal with, yeah, just go copy it. Just try. I mean, yeah. you're not copying it to sell it as your own. Right. You're just copying it to understand it. That's to it. Understand. To do well, what here's it. A good, here's a good thing that I actually like broke down the other day. So there's always that quote going around, like good artists copy or bad artists copy, good artists steal. Right. Right. I never understood what that meant. I was like, wait, so you steal their artwork? Like, that doesn't make any sense. That's not cool. Like, right. To me, what it really means is like copying somebody else's artwork is a wholly physical act. So it's hand eye coordination. So I'm looking at this drawing and I'm doing this drawing with my hand. Right. There's no mm -hmm. thinking involved. But stealing, on the other hand, is copying somebody's drawing, but copying it for the purposes of understanding what they're doing. And, but, and the stealing aspect comes in when you internalize what they've done. Right. You take ownership of it. Yes, exactly. So you're stealing the essence of that drawing. You're assimilating it into yourself. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Like, you're not copying it anymore. You're, you're internalizing it, and it's becoming a part of you, and it's becoming a part of your style. So I think if you're doing that and not just copying, like, you know, you're, I don't think you run the risk of it looking like so-and-so's art. So. Well, and I think why is an important question when yes. you, I mean, well, it's always an important oh, yeah. question, but I mean, especially for the student or the aspiring artist, aspiring character designer who is asking this question about style. Like, if that's what's on your mind, then it's especially important to go and understand why certain artists made certain stylistic decisions. I think if you're copying another artist's drawing, that should almost be the only question. Why did he make this decision? Why does the nose look like this? Why does, you know, like, you know, and some of them are going to have necessary answers. Like, why does, why did he do the nose nostril like this? Like, maybe he just did. Why does this form go like this? You know, what's happening? Like, you're breaking it down and you're trying to understand it, you know. I guess what's happening would be a good question, too. There is a larger why question, which is, what do you do about details? Right. Do you even put a nostril on the character? That is yeah. an important stylistic decision that you have. You know, I mean, most animated characters don't have nostrils. Most CG animated characters of recent history do not have nostrils. Yeah, that's you know, true. and it's like they're just you look at Carl Fredrickson or or Mr. Right. Incredible. There's an implied. Yes. Anatomy to his nose, but it's almost just a like a Muppet nose, really, right, you know, right. a triangular Muppet nose. That is an important yeah, stylist question, and true. the nostril is thusly a clue as I to why. I think it's a, a poorly forgotten detail on the face. I think it needs to come back. I like that you're, you know, that you said that, like, you feel less threatened, because it is true, like, you don't, like, as a teacher, too, you don't want to sit up there and say, like, copy other people's artwork, you know, like, what kind of teaching is that? But I think there is a lot to be gained from it. I'm always scared to tell my students to do the same thing. You know, because the, the, the last thing you want is for, you know, now a student's work starts to look just like his favorite artist. You know? Exactly, exactly, which is terrible. Um, yes. That goes exactly against what we're trying to achieve as teachers. Exactly. So I think that's I think the fear is that you undermine everything else you've tried to do. But the, right. reason we're, the reason we have a hesitancy to encourage students to copy is because copying has been abused so much. Right. I agree. And, and maybe that's part of it. Maybe it's that I know my students and they're so smart and capable and brave that there is no threat no yeah, that's doing true. that yeah. you know how do you explore a character design you've talked about connecting the character in the drawing but what does that look like for you in your process um i mean like literally what do you do like literally what yeah. I, for me there's like almost two modes of drawing there's doodling you know which is just 
playing with shapes and yeah. messing around or whatever. And then there's sometimes I'll actually sit down, like if I'm creating a portfolio piece or if I'm, you know, doing something for work, um, when you, you have to sit down and create a character, you really have to think about who this character is, you know? Like, so if I'm creating, you know, if I have a story in mind um, and I have this character, you know, a lot of time goes into thinking about, like, what this person's character or what this character's personality is going to be and like how they interact in certain situations and then you know all of that stuff you know helps inform how i'm going to go about designing it if it's a cute girl you know it's you know so then you know the head is bigger and you know all of that you know kind of generic stuff but then you know like once that stuff all comes into play like you know big shapes and you know i i think shape wise it's you know, always start with big shapes and stuff like that and then start whittling away at it. And when you say big <laughs> shapes, you mean the overall shape yes. of the character. Right, right, right. Not like if I'm drawing a girl, I'm going to draw a big square or anything. Right. Like, <laughs> Although it could yeah, be the interesting. Overall, yeah, the overall gesture of the character, you know. But, you know, that's kind of how it always starts for me. It's like I think of who this character is going to be and then I start with the overall shape and you know, what I kind of have in mind with that. And then I start whittling away at it personality wise and then costuming and all of that stuff. So, you know, you work general to the specific, you know, that's kind of how I work. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I figure out the specifics, you know, personality and character wise in my head first. And then, you know, artistically I work general to specific. So well, that's great. And then did you do any, uh, background or environment stuff for adventure or was that all character? No, I did do, backgrounds and stuff and this is like you know this is i tell my my students this and well i'll tell anybody who listens really um <laughs> but this is where like i think a certain amount of versatility comes into play so they you know they hired me on to first do passes on the characters and so i did and you know while they were actually reviewing the characters he emailed me back and said hey we just saw that you have environments on your in your portfolio on your portfolio site and we really like them and we want you to take some stabs at the environments so I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, while I'm waiting for notes back from the characters, I'm doing environments. And then, you know, and then they actually didn't go with my character designs. I think Jose's designs were the ones they used for the final designs. But um, then they knew that I could do characters and I could do environments. So then I started putting characters in environments for sizzle images and stuff like that. You know, like it's kind of go in the pitch Bible and the, the style guide. You know, so it is good to know, to be able to go a little bit you know, left and right of your comfort zone. You know, you kind of have to have like a comfort bubble where I can work, you know, I can work a little bit this way. I can work a little bit this way stylistically too, you know, cause that, I think that lends to you being more hireable and more desirable. Okay. Do you think about environments any differently than you think about characters, props, environments, et cetera, the, the other aspects of visual development? That's actually the advice that Brett gave me that kind of opened up that valve for me hmm. was to not think about it any differently, right. that it has to have personality and character just like a character would. And, and it kind of comes from the fact that I don't like drawing straight lines. Like, you know, it's funny that my dad's an architect. Like, I hate drawing, like, straight lines. So everything I do anyway is, like, organic looking and skewed if I do buildings anyway just because I don't want to draw, like, straight lines and perfect perspective and all this stuff just because it bores me but that helps the fact that i'm lazy really <laughs> like <laughs> so i do think of it like more of like a character and like kind of an organic thing that has personality and stuff like that what do you feel like was the moment that was the most difficult to overcome in your career so far and what what was the uh, the triumph like what was that process like i think it was really the self-doubt thing you know in the, the dark times you know when i was unemployed because mm -hmm. that was I remember that being like actually really tough. Like there was actually like, you know, and I, I joked about it earlier, like face down on the floor. Like there were times when I was like face down on the floor in the carpet. Yeah. Saying, right. This is not going to happen. And I had thrown my, my stylus across the room, I think at some point, but that was definitely the hardest thing to overcome is to realize that like, no, I can do this. Like I just have to do it. And then, you know, the triumph was the best, like there's still tinges of self doubt. And I think there always will be, you know, as an artist, oh, but sure. But, you know, it's not nearly as bad as it used to be because I've kind of overcome that. Like, I got that first job. I've supported myself for three years exclusively doing art. You know, it's like I'm, I'm rolling now. You know, there's not as much of a fear as of, like, oh, I'm going to have to go work at a 
comic book store again. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, right. That 35 years old, you know, so my mindset has changed from I just need to get good enough to now I want to be the best. You right. know, like now I want to be as good as I can be, yeah. you know. And it is, it's like, you know, it's like one of my favorite things to say is like, it's, you know, art is really a lifelong journey, you know, like I'll be drawing until I croak. So, and then it's, you have to love the process and, you know, I've learned to love the process a lot and I think I can take greater joy in it now. Let's speak uh, for a second specifically to the aspiring character designers. Okay. And because of the the question I'm going to ask next, I need to make a distinction. I refer to aspiring character designers and pre-professional character designers Mm -hmm. differently because pre-professionals are those folks who are where you were during your dark times. Right. You know, (laughs) during. I hate that we keep referring to it as the dark times (laughs) because that wasn't I mean, it was there were dark moments in that. But it was also, you know, the portfolio phase, the growing pains, the post. Yeah, there you go. The post Disney interactive chat blogger. uh, uh, Yeah, that's pre-professional. It's you're right right there. You know, you're right in front of the break. Right. You know, and are you right behind the break? I don't know. Um, The point is, it's (laughs) right. You're just you're on the cusp. You're, you're, on, right you're knocking at the door. Yeah, you know? exactly. You're on and, the doorstep. You're knocking on the door. Yeah. yeah. And then aspiring is kind of everyone else before that phase. And it's not to those of you listening now, I'm not trying to imply that you're necessarily going to be aware of your own. Right. You know, sometimes you will. Sometimes it'll be very obvious, but then other times not. But anyway, that's for you, Justin. I'd like to to hear your thoughts on those two groups specifically. What do you feel like the aspiring character designers, what kinds of questions should they be asking or what questions should they be asking, but they aren't? Generally to themselves or to or, other or artists? To, or to others, either either way. I think we talked about it earlier. They should be asking why. For one, you know, on a personal level, why are they doing this? Like, why do they want to do this? Because I think that has a big... Oh, yeah. I think that has a big play in it. And it's it's hard to explain because like we were talking about my past and like I like cartoons, so I want to be an animator. Or I mean I want to be in animation. But I feel like sometimes there's a difference. There's some people who like cartoons and they just want to be in animation in general. And then there's for me it was more like the artistry. Yes, I wanted to be a character designer, yes, I wanted to be in animation, but I wanted to also be a very good artist and I still want to be a very good artist and I will never stop growing to be an artist. And I feel like I've run across both. I've run across students and aspiring character designers who who just like cartoons and they like the animation industry and they just want to be a part of it. And they think that they just want to be character designers just because, you know, they heard about character design. And I think there's also the ones who really want to understand the artistry. I don't know if just liking cartoons and just wanting to be in the animation industry is enough per se sometimes. So why are you doing this? And then also... When you're working and you're creating characters and you're creating a portfolio, why are you creating this character? What, like, who is this character? Why are you making these decisions? That was always one of my favorite questions, you know, when I would get an artist one-on-one and like doing a demo or something is I would always ask them like, why did you do that? Why did you make that decision? And I think that's kind of what helps you understand artistically and character design wise. So Disney prep and landing Uh is like amazing. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And there's a character in the second one, and he's one of the old coal elves. And instead of a light on his head, he has a candle. Yeah. You know, and I'm just like, oh man, like that's amazing. It's this old guy who they didn't have lights back when he was yeah. coal mine. You know, they only had candles. He hasn't learned and the it, newfangled technology. Right. <laughs> and when you think, like, why does he have a candle on his head? Oh, that's right, because he's old. You know, so. I guess it's like, it's kind of cheesy, but that's great. No, it's, you good. know, ask why, you know, understand, just try to understand things, everything. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. And to the pre-professional artist, uh, mm-hmm. specifically character designers who are face down on their office floor, they've just <laughs> thrown their Cintiq stylus across yeah. the room. Perhaps they're in a phase of unemployment where they began the season all revved up and right. uh, this is exciting. Woohoo, I'm jumping out of the plane and now they're in the terror moment <laughs> in between before the shoot <laughs> opens. What do you have to say to them? What, what advice would you give to them? Maybe they're even uh, laying on the floor face down as they're listening to this podcast. As right they're now. listening <laughs> to this podcast. Okay, first, get up. It, it will go away. Yeah. <laughs> like, the feeling will pass. 
don't give up. Especially like, you know, if you're at that point where you're where you've already jumped out of the plane, like you can't crawl back into the plane now. So you might as well make the best of it. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that's like, great. You can't you can't go back to the plane, and if your parachute's not working, like you have to find a way to make it work. MacGyver that thing together, <laughs> you know. Like really, like don't just don't give up, and surround yourself with other artists. I think that helped me a lot. Yeah, you know, I worked really hard, but I also had lunch with friends, you know, a lot when you know, because I had also have a good friend, you know. Well, one of them was Brett Bean that I hung out with a lot then, and then um, I have a friend who's actually a storyboard artist for feature films. And he's like a brilliant draftsman, mm. you know, and we would have coffee a lot in the mornings. And it's just that camaraderie, oh, yeah. you know, like, you know, and then you can voice your like, dude, it just isn't going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen for me. And they'll help you. You know, it's not like a therapy group, you know, <laughs> like, right. I don't want to dump all that on my friends. But, you know, they're like, no, nah, man, just, you know, keep going. Just so I think surrounding yourself with other artists like, you know, listening to podcasts like this is inspirational, too. Mm. And then I kind of like. For me, at that point, inspiration was motivation. So the more I got inspired, the more I felt motivated yeah. to get better. And you have to be careful because, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're in a funk and you start looking at like all of these crazy blogs and, you know, all this stuff, then it could be detrimental. But if you're in a good space, you know, try to get yourself inspired. You know, does that make sense? Like oh, if yeah, you're in a completely. funk, like you don't want to. Like sometimes like looking at certain, like one blog will just kill it, you know, yeah. it's just like that will lead to you being face down on the floor. <laughs> you know, like, oh, yeah. Pascal um, Campion was saying about how there was a time where he basically did sort of an art blog blackout. He just didn't, mm. you know, and I, I don't remember the exact nuances of his motivations there, but I, yeah. I, I would not doubt that they are similar and I just need to clear my mind right. out i just yeah. i need to make my own art right now and i've done plenty of that <laughs> and i think that's good too like that's an interesting thing um i think like i said i think it can be really beneficial sometimes like i said because sometimes when i see it i go i can do that you know like and then it motivates me to get better or it's like that is so good i want to do that so then i get motivated to try and get there and then sometimes like depending on the headspace you're in you just get super depressed so i think you should be cognizant of how you're feeling like because you know as an artist like you can almost kind of feel a funk coming on you know it's like oh this drawing didn't come out so good okay maybe i'll do another one you know it's like it it almost like kind of builds up so like if you're starting to feel that maybe it is a good idea to kind of just focus on yourself and focus on your own art and yeah. do what you do you know yep all right. Any uh, any parting words for the listeners? Not that uh, this is going to be your last time on the art cast. I have a feeling you've got, uh, <laughs> much more in the tank. But um, any other thoughts? Any anything else you want to wrap yeah, up with? Yeah, like, you know, it's you know, anybody who comes up to me at CTN and asks like how I get better or you know whatever it may be, um, it's in the the answer is always to draw more. And it sounds like such a cop out answer. And it's not necessarily to draw more, it's to learn. But I always just say, just keep drawing. Um, and it always seems like such a cop-out answer, and I usually tell them that. Like, this is such a cop-out answer, but it's totally true. And it's, uh -huh. it's all, you know, it's mostly a matter of time and, you know, understanding and to take it seriously. You know, like, I'm always thinking about art. You know, like, it's just always in my head. You know, anytime I look at something, I'm think, trying to figure out how it works. And, you know, and it's just something I've always kind of done. So, be a nerd. You know, be a nerd of the world and draw all the time. So, <laughs> be a nerd of the world, nerd of the world. <laughs> and draw all the time. That is fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Sarah Marino, welcome back to the Artcast. Austin, welcome back to this same episode. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. For the listeners who don't know, Sarah is one of our instructors at the Oatley Academy. And Austin, as you already know, is one of her students. And he's here to share the story of a recent career breakthrough. It's an amazing story, and I really look forward to sharing it with you. But first, Sarah, let's provide some context for the listeners. Uh, your course wasn't actually a course at all. It was a mentorship. And uh, unlike some of our other courses, painting drama and films on paper, uh, which teach specific concepts and workflows and techniques, 
um, your mentorship was designed to help the students with their specific struggles and help them reach their specific goals and dreams. So to begin, can you just share a little bit about your approach? Yeah, I was really interested in figuring out what everyone's kind of individual voice is from style to substance. And something I really wanted to focus on was what do the students want to say? What is it that they want to say with their work and what kind of process helps them convey that? And so that was really how I wanted to approach the mentorship session was just figuring out how my students could be able to communicate visually and, you know, be happy and satisfied with their work and subsequently, hopefully, their place in the animation or publishing or illustration world. You know, I didn't want to force anyone to work a certain way, but it was also kind of breaking down why an image works from silhouette to value, you know, composition, color. The, I mean, these are all things that as artists, even if you choose to only work in black and white or to only work flat, these are still like important decisions that kind of define, you know, how successful your image communicates your idea. The plan was is that every student moving forward when they're making an image, even if it's just drawing in their sketchbook, they're thinking consciously about their choices. And it's the choices that we make that kind of define what we're trying to say as an artist. So, Austin, you had kind of a personal revelation during the course um, about where you belong in the world of commercial art uh, and about your own visual voice. Yeah, I mean, I'm a self-taught artist, and so I'm constantly battling insecurities. Oh, yeah. I started early on turning in my assignments trying to adopt a different workflow rather than like what I'm really good at is, is drawing. I like drawing a lot and I like the comic, I guess you could call me a cartoonist in, in the style that I use. And so I was trying to pull away from that because, you know, everyone else is turning in cool paintings. For a long time, I've just kind of wanted to dabble in like a, a hundred different styles and, and different types of um, methods just because I felt like I should know everything before I truly commit to one thing. And like it, it really did take like listening to Sarah and listening to you and and listening to this podcast of hearing people that are like, oh, they they don't seem like they have every single thing nailed down and they seem like they got jobs. So Mm. I started like sweating that a little bit less. And I actually wrote a a blog post on my website if you're if you're the reading type um, uh, about uh, some of the the things that I took away from the course that was, um, you know, a little uh, a little more intangible. than just here's a picture I, I did while I was in it. But um, <laughs> yeah, one of the things I, I learned that was huge for me was just like the, the start of it when Sarah kind of you know, showed us that working in animation, you know, in quotes, uh, can mean so many different things. <laughs> um, and uh, that right there kind of stuck with me as I'm like trying to pull off somebody else's style or method. Uh, and, and, you know, she keeps hitting that beat of like, there's no, there's more than just one job. There's lots of different things that you can do. And I realized, oh, m- maybe s- my style can fit. And that, after discovering that, was was huge for me. And then it also helped me grow. And I was suddenly more confident in what I was doing. Uh, you know, Sarah, I think, really latched onto it, and it really helped me feel more confident. And and it same with all of my students, which was like another thing that I learned in there is that art friends are the best kind of friends. <laughs> like, so true. You know, like being in there with everybody else and also like hitting that moment, that aha moment of like, oh, I like this is how, you know, I, I have this kind of more graphic novel cartoony style and that's that works and it's fine to do that for what I'm going for. And, you know, to everybody else, they have their own kind of things as well. And uh, I think that that was a was a huge breakthrough for me to realize that there's there's a lot, a lot more room in the animation industry than you would think. Yeah. Any other lessons you want to share before we get to your story? Uh, it's not just your growth that helps you grow. That was that was a big thing. So you know, the the critiques that you receive on your work, um, you know, they're they're helpful. Um, but you shouldn't tune out when it's not your turn. Right. Um, and, you know, I've taken online courses before in, in different websites and things like that. And it's like it's not a class setting. Right. Um, where there's everybody else is there and you're there to, you know, watch every, everyone else get critiqued as well. And 
man, that's so great. Just watching Sarah work and just watching other people grow helps you grow. Sarah is freaking brilliant at hmm. critiquing. Um, yeah. Chris, you had said this in the podcast, but then when I watched it happen, I was like, <laughs> what? And I remember the next day at work, you know, because I was, you know, kind of at work like, yeah, I'm in this uh, mentorship with this lady that works for Nickelodeon, no big deal. Um, <laughs> and uh, talking with my designer friends at work, and I remember pulling up one of the PSDs from one of the classes and showing this guy like, here's mine. And then I clicked the layer on of what Sarah did. And he was like, whoa. I'm like, I know, right? And I got to see her do this. This is amazing. Uh, like that right there is so, so valuable. I've done tons of online courses and tutorials and things like that. But the interaction with somebody yeah. and having them like draw over your stuff to really address what it is that you're doing is insanely valuable. Uh, like I I could not recommend doing this enough. Uh, if you are thinking about auditioning, you definitely should. Yeah. And yeah, God, every class was just amazing. There was one that you sat in on that. Um, that was fun. That, yeah, was like a double whammy of like she would start talking and then uh, start drawing. And then while she's drawing, you were talking on top of that. And like so much focus critique on every single image. I felt like I was like, I walked away knowing so much more about wow. how I was going to tackle my next one. And I, th I think after that one was when I had the kind of breakthrough of like, oh, OK, you know, I can I can stop trying to uh, paint in a certain way and, and do what it is that I do best. You get more from it than maybe you might expect. Just go in with like a I'm ready to learn a lot and uh, come out on the other side of this uh, a better artist and it doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to come out on the other side of this. I now I can draw super awesome capes <laughs> like <laughs> I'm the best cape drawer ever. Um, <laughs> there are specific tutorials online if you want to get better at drawing capes. This is, I think, to make you a better overall artist because um, I, I know it's helped me. And I'm forever thankful for for the mentorship and the the uh, the connections I've made. And this is why deeply invested mentors and a strong circle of trust are essential for artistic growth, which is exactly why we exhaust ourselves at the Oatly Academy <laughs> designing, organizing, and teaching 100% real-time instructor-led courses. Oh, yeah. And like, I, I remember the, the, after the first class, you know, I didn't go to art school. And so I was like, is this what art school is like? I don't, right. I don't know. This is magical. Yeah. Uh, you know, my parents were in town that weekend visiting uh, of the first class. I remember getting out of there and they're like, how did it go? And I was like, this is amazing. She's so talented and my <laughs> classmates are so talented and I know things now. <laughs> I know things now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it's so good. So as you were on this journey with Sarah and the rest of the class, you went viral. <laughs> okay, so the first few uh, classes, well, I guess it started in October, they were, you know, research-based, and we were, like, learning a lot about the animation industry. We were trying to put together our um, inspiration boards and stuff like that. So I decided to participate in Inktober. I, I love doing, like, doodle-a-day challenges and stuff like that just because uh, I like projects. I feel like it makes me, um, you know, you just get better just by doing it. And so I wanted to do Inktober, but I didn't have a topic. And I know coming up with a topic is a pain in the butt every day. So some guys at work sent me that um, Reddit thread from like 2011, 2012 about removing a letter from a movie title and, you know, talking about what that new movie is. And we like wasted like a half an hour at work just laughing and, and reading the back and forth. <laughs> and by, by the way, I, I work as a copywriter, so I'm uh, not in, in uh, the art industry. So I was like, okay, one guy suggested, you should just draw these for your Inktober. And I'm like, yeah, that would be funny. And like most of my artwork, I did it just to amuse me and the people around me. The first day I drew Obocop, and he's like got like a little sexy hip thing going on um, <laughs> playing an oboe. And I brought it into work, and I showed them. We all laughed, and I was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this the rest of the month. Um, <laughs> and I did. With Sarah's class still going on, I would only I would do it like while my kids were eating breakfast or at lunch at work, just in my sketchbook, 20, 30 minutes tops. And then at the end of the month, uh, a guy 
at work said, you know, you should just make a gallery and put them all on Reddit and like show them that you, that you did this. Uh, I think it, they'll respond well. And I was like, uh, okay, I've never posted on Reddit, and I know they got a lot of like weird rules, <laughs> and and it scares me. So he told me I made the gallery, and then I went over to his desk, and he like posted it for me. And I did not expect that. He told me it would do well. Um, but throughout the month, they were getting like 15, 20 likes a piece on Instagram when I put them up every day. Uh huh. So I, you know, I thought like a couple hundred people might like it. Right. And then it was like a million people. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was crazy. I didn't get, I got zero work done that day because yeah. I just, emails started pouring yeah. in. People responded to it like, oh, I want T-shirts and posters. And I'm like, you people want to wear these things? <laughs> like, what is happening to me? And so then I'm scrambling. People are pulling down some of my art already and trying to like vectorize it so they can pass out stuff. And I'm like, oh, oh, my God. Uh, and one of the guys at work was like, hey, you should just put a link in the original gallery of like if they're interested in T-shirts and prints to uh, like fill out a, a pre-order form or whatever and then they can um, uh, yeah. if they're really interested in, in purchasing some of your art they'll get it when it's ready and I was like okay that's cool it's a great idea and then by the end of the week I had 2,000 emails um, oh god <laughs> <laughs> it was like uh, my wife and I every night after we put the kids to bed would just sit there going through this giant spreadsheet of people saying, you know, what pictures they wanted and they'd be interested in buying this and can they get a commission for that? Wow. And um, it was just insane. And at the same time, um, you know, all these websites are posting my art and running the headline of like illustrator Austin Light does this or artist Austin Light does this. And for the first time, I'm seeing my name and stuff introduced as an illustrator. Um, you know, I've always been a writer that like, I'm a writer that likes to draw. Or um, I do a little art on the side kind of thing. Yeah. And to see like artist writer or illustrator writer on all these headlines was like, oh, man, I guess people see me as this now. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Which is really, really cool. Uh, so, yeah, it, it kind of took off and, and went in all these different directions. Um, uh, lots of random celebrities shared it. Robert Downey Jr. Yeah, Robert Downey Jr. shared one yeah. on Facebook. And he like linked back to my website, which was really cool. Sarah, what do you make of this? What do you make of this whole? When you when you hear that story, and especially when you think about applying this this to the art cast audience, like the people who are listening, like I mean, yes, there it is an end in and of itself to celebrate this with Austin, right? I mean, to just this is awesome and be happy for you and everything. But in a what do we? How do we interpret? Yeah. This. What is your? I mean, what do you think about that? Well, it's so funny because I don't mean this in a bad way, but like Austin's story would not have been even possible, what, five, ten oh, years yeah. ago? Yeah, and totally. The, the internet is just this amazing machine that cannot be stopped, you know, thankfully. And as <laughs> artists, we, we have to tap into that because, I mean, you just have to be able to put your work out there. And, you know, Austin has been struggling with his confidence, as all artists do. But, I mean, he mustered up the courage to post his Inktobers. And he wow. had a friend who was a little bit more internet savvy than he was help him kind of put it out there in a forum that he most likely would not have done on his own. And I think that's just a testament to a lot of different things that kind of influence us as artists. It's just your networking, your friendships. You don't realize how all the people you meet in your life are going to come back and help you in different ways. And your friend deserves several beers in his name. Oh, yeah. No, uh, there's two guys, and they both got thank yous in the back of the book. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. Much deserved. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's this kind of new age for us as artists where our work is not only accessible to those that, you know, purchase the magazine it's in or buy the movie ticket or, you know, it's a part of culture. And it's a part of, you know, people go and check Reddit every day when they're at work or in their car or, well, hopefully not driving. Um, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just it's yeah. such – and not just Reddit, you know, Twitter, Instagram. These are all things that are now like integral parts of people's lives. Yeah. And, you know, I've gotten jobs because of Twitter. Yeah. Um, I have friends who have like successful commission-based businesses simply from having like a huge following on Instagram. So there's wow. – 
this this whole new wave of how as artists we can you know not just make money but ha- find an audience and it's amazing that Austin's humor and his sensible yeah. way of handling like his humor with his art was able to reach and communicate with so many people that you know without the internet without friends who you know know technology those things wouldn't have been possible and i just think that's absolutely amazing like what a cool time to like be an artist something i wanted to point out austin is that you didn't shelve your skills as a copywriter right your your copywriting skill was not wasted and in fact your success has come from the merging of both your art and your writing Right. And it's it's like all of the insecurity issues I have as an artist just don't exist as a right. writer. Um, I've been like writing professionally since I was 17. My mom got me a job being a reporter for the Charleston Air Force Base's newspaper. And I've just I got two degrees related to writing. I've just been doing it so long that, you know, I really liked writing a stupid joke with each one of these things. Yeah. And never, I didn't even think twice. I would draw the picture and then write the joke spur of the moment as I'm posting it. And um, I didn't really realize how, how much I was marrying the two of those things together until um, one, one of the websites ran them without all the captions. And there were people in the comments like, what is this? What is happening here? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, well, they should have captions on there. Yeah, <laughs> that's part of the deal. So... That's not the end of the story, though. No. no. There's more. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there is more. <laughs> so there's this other thing. Um, when I was uh, 24, I made it a goal, uh, a life goal, that I was going to have a book on like the shelves at Barnes & Noble by the time I turned 30. And so I spent the next six years going to conferences, uh, meeting with writing groups. Uh, I wrote two young adult novels. I shopped them around. I went to SCBWI conferences, sometimes as an artist, sometimes as a writer, trying to get this to happen. And I knew it was it's the publishing um, industry is slow. And so I thought that six years was a pretty good length of time. I'm like, surely I can get something up by then. And so I was in the middle of I was kind of subbing my second young adult novel around uh, when I was 29, and I kept getting kind of feedback that, like, uh, this is great, but kind of like what Jimmy Gowling said in um, his thing, but the opposite of that they were boy protagonists and teenage boys don't read, can I please make this a graphic novel? Uh, so wow. it's like, oh, bummer. I read when I was a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so did I. I would like my boys to as well. Huh. So then I was just like, uh, I'll shelve this for a while. And, and somebody came back and told me I should rewrite it in first person, which it's more than just switching pronouns. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing that on the side and everything. And as it's blowing up on Reddit, um, like two, three days in, people start asking me if I'm going to have a book of these things. Wow. And I thought, oh, that would, that would be neat. And so I started looking into um, uh, the service blurb. Yeah. who actually contacted me and said, hey, uh, as B- Blurb employees, um, we get to make a free book a month and we want to make one of your art. What the heck? And I was like, right on. Let's... <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> That's cool. And so then I was like, okay, I'll get this book. I'll like sell it through my website or whatever. Um, and if people like it, then maybe after that I can say, hey, here's this book. I'll approach a, um, an yeah. actual publisher. And then uh, someone that works was like, hey, you know that people make books of stuff that go viral on the internet. You should look them up. And I, you know, I came across Chronicle Books. They have books about grumpy cats. They have um, hmm. Movies Are Fun, which is, uh, I believe Josh Cooley did it. And it's like these um, really nice like uh, little golden books, pictures, but of R-rated movies. <laughs> There's uh, uh, the Je- Jeffrey Brown's um, Vader and Son. And um, oh this I love is like, that one. yeah, stories of like Luke Skywalker. Um, and then he's like had a couple follow ups to that um, of like Good Night, Darth Vader and stuff. So they have an open submissions page uh, that says, you know, if you have a book idea or, or a pitch or whatever, email this kind of generic email address. Response time is about three months, which is about normal for the book industry. So okay. I figured, what do I have to lose? I'll yeah. just what send an email in and say, hey. I sent a link to the image gallery. I was like, this was on Reddit. It's currently got 1.3 million views. <laughs> uh, don't know if you're into this. It would be a neat book. Thanks, bye. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Um, so I sent that in. 
<laughs> and then like two hours later, I get an email from my now editor, Steve. He's like, hey, yes, we would be interested. Let's set up a phone call tomorrow. And I was like, oh, <laughs> um, freaking out. And yeah, so we called. Uh, he asked me, can you make a couple of nicer, you know, kind of redraw these? He went uh, through my website, which is why, again, it's great to have uh, a yeah. website and be online. He, w- he went through my website. And he was like, we, we like your sketches, but uh, uh, that's not really what we'd make a book of. But we went to your site and saw that you're capable of doing more. So could you um, redraw them in, in one of these more finished styles that you have on your website? And I'll take them with me to the pitch and see if we can get this a book. And so I um, spent the next few days just drawing like crazy to get a few of them re- redone. And like it was like Ron Man and Jurassic Park and Pup Fiction, <laughs> some of the most requested ones. So um, yeah. <laughs> I did those and, and sent them to him. And I also at the same time set up movietitletypos.com. Um, awesome. No one had that. <laughs> so and What a great title. I know. So <laughs> he... Um, it was much better than the films with one letter missing uh, yeah. <laughs> hashtag that was being used. They took it to their thing, and he came back and was like, yeah, this is going to happen. Let's make this a book. And this was all at the same time that I have the mentorship going on. So I was like, oh, yeah. boy. Um, <laughs> and were you privy to this, Sarah, or what, did Austin just, like, disappear? No. Like, what? <laughs> uh, Austin reached out to me, and he, you know, it was great. I was able to, I mean... I've never had a 1.3 million viral Reddit thread, right? <laughs> but um, I was at least able to be like, you know, yeah, like publishing Chronicle Books, this is good. And I, he and I, you know, went back and forth a little bit and he was asking me a few questions, but he's been so great doing this that, you know, he really didn't need much of my help at all, mm. but, you know, he was keeping me updated. I might be a little slow with some uh, assignments because of, you know, <laughs> this little thing here. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> that's amazing. No worries. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's been great. It's such an odd thing, though, because to, like, become Internet famous um, because it was like that week, um, you know, my my inbox is just exploding and it's burying me under all that stuff. Uh, and a lot of coworkers coming out to me like, oh, my God, I can't believe what's happening. But at the same time, like I could go over to that Burger King over there and no one cares. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's just so surreal and so strange. So I always felt weird, like bringing it up. But I did. I told uh, Sarah that I quoted her to my wife because Steve at Chronicle was like, OK, we're going to get this book in the pipeline um, it'll be spring 2016. That's when we can fit it in. Uh, and that'll give you till, you know, probably about May to get all your art in. Um, and I was like, okay, cool. That sounds good. And then he comes back like a day later and he was like, okay, never mind. Let's, we want to get this book out next fall. So wow. that's going to mean you're going to need to have all your art in by the end of February. You think you could do that? And um, oh my. <laughs> I, I remember Sarah on the podcast that she was on saying that, you know, you just say yes to the um, yeah. book people right? because they, <laughs> they don't have the most flexible schedules. And even if that means you're drawing on Christmas, you say yes. So I was like, oh, yeah, no, sure. That's no problem. I'll, I'll get that done. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I hung off the phone and I was like, oh, what did I just do? <laughs> um, and I, I definitely was drawing on Christmas. I'm on my like, second to last picture right now. Um, wow. And it, has, it has been a, a second full-time job. Over the last uh, couple months, I didn't even get to do my last assignment in Sarah's class. I felt terrible about it. Oh, stop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was just like, um, yeah, I, I have a full time job and two small children, and I'd get up in the morning and draw while they're eating breakfast. And then I bought a Cintiq companion so I could draw at lunch at work in a conference room. And then awesome. I'd get home and put them to bed by 7 45 and then draw till 1 a.m. And then get up at six the next morning, and I've been doing that since mid December, and I might die. Uh, yeah. So this could be the last you hear of me. Yeah, yeah. I I was oh. running on fumes two weeks ago, yeah. so it's just like <laughs> coffee and inertia right now is just <laughs> keeping me going. <laughs> well, you're going out with a bang if that's the case, <laughs> but uh, hopefully you'll be around for many, many more books. It's really like it's it's a dream come true, and you know yeah. for all of the work it's been, it's also been really validating to have to work oh, this yeah. hard, you know, because I wasn't planning for it to go viral. 
I work in marketing. I know if you plan for things to go viral, they don't. Right. Um, <laughs> so I, I, you know, I was just doing something to amuse myself and my friends, and and then you know all these opportunities fell in my lap, and it didn't just like go from there though. After that, I had to put in a lot of work, and it was it's been weirdly validating to have to hustle so much to get this done in time, and uh, it's it's exciting, and you know I wish I had longer to work on some of the arts. I've posted some in Sarah's uh, Facebook group that we have, um, and everyone has given me some really great critiques to help me like polish some of the art. And I wish I could do that with every single picture, but I can't because I don't have that time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Austin and Sarah, tell the good people where they can find you online and uh, what your favorite way to interact online is. We'll start with Austin. Um, you can find me at uh, austindlight.com. That's Austin, letter D, and then light. Yes, my middle initial is actually D. Um, <laughs> Classic. Yeah, yes. I try not to pun my own name, though. Yeah, it's even kind of a, your name is a pun. I know, I know. It's, it's meant to be. Of, you know, when you, like, whenever you're at, I'm at, like, a grocery store and, like, someone needs to, like, see my ID and they're like, oh, yuck, and they have to make that joke. <laughs> like, no, I haven't heard that one. Good one. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm AustinDelight.com because the city of Austin's light rail has Austin light. Not nearly as interesting. Yeah, yeah. bummer. No. Uh, yeah. AustinDelight.com or at AustinDelight on Twitter. Um, I'm always uh, on Twitter at night uh, procrastinating from drawing more. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> oh, Melting yes. down. And, and don't uh, forget uh, MovieTitleTypos.com. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That other thing I did. MovieTitleTypos.com. Yeah. Um, I've just had my head down working like crazy to get the you know 50 something images done um over the last month and a half but i'll start doing more updates uh going forward there'll be a whole marketing thing and prints and giveaways and uh i'm gonna have a giant post on reddit saying thank you so much and i'll give away a, a bunch of cool stuff and also um yeah the book comes out this fall should be in stores everywhere Wow, that's amazing. It's, it's absolutely <laughs> that's so amazing. cool. It's really cool. Yeah. I just saw yeah. the cover the other day, and it like it feels oh, really man. weird. That's yeah. so cool. Twitter, that is such a great way to get a hold of me. I respond to every tweet I get at Sarah Marino. Sarah with an H. With an H. And uh, my website is sarahmarino.com. And then Instagram, Sarah, the letter K, Marino. Thank you guys so much. This has been a blast. Oh, thank you, Chris. Oh, thank you. This is been great like i listen to this podcast every week and um i'm on it which is doesn't Isn't that <laughs> surreal <laughs> yes it does. Oh, so great like, wow i know what? i've been in your shoes and it's crazy <laughs> and e- the responses from everyone that i've ever gotten it's so great to hear that everyone loves the podcast as much as we love you chris because mm. you do such a fantastic job with this so oh, thank you I, so much i have to say chris i was telling my wife this of like every time I get done listening to one of your interviews, it, I'm instantly like, man, I want to be friends with that person that he interviewed. Yeah, It's your questions or just the subject matter. When you got done talking with Adam Westbrook, I was like, I need to move to Paris and like yeah. be best friends with him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, it's, that's all the guests, you know? I mean, it's that we just have amazing people. That's, that's what it comes down to. Well, you're pretty amazing too. Amazing attracts amazing. Come on. Uh, well, thanks guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, friends, Sarah has been hard at work on a new course for the Oatly Academy, and this is different from but related to the mentorship that she and Austin were talking about. There's going to be some overlapping content, but this is a fully developed real-time course led by Sarah. It has an established curriculum and numerous huge takeaways for the students. If you are interested in learning from Sarah, go to chrisoatley.com forward slash JR2. Again, that's Justin Rodriguez and the number two, JR2. And scroll about halfway down the post, you'll see a link to sign up for the early notification list for Sarah's new course. If you're on that list, we will only send notifications about 
uh, this course that Sarah is developing. Whenever the course becomes available, we will send an email to that list saying, hey, go now, auditions are open. And uh, yeah, you'll want to get right on that because we're, we're fortunate in that our courses fill up very quickly, as in within the first 24 hours. So you will, yeah, you'll want to definitely be on that early notification list if you want a chance to get into Sarah's course. And uh, yeah, as you can tell, uh, from Austin's testimonial, she is a fantastic teacher. Really, really good. Um, as are all of our teachers at Oatley Academy. Uh, that's why we have so few. Um, <laughs> but more to come in 2015. Okay, so chrisoatley.com forward slash JR2. I can't wait to engage with you in the comments there. Stay tuned, friends. We've got some more great guests coming up on the Artcast and on the Paper Wings show. 2015 is going to be a great year, an important year at the Oatley Academy, so stay strong and stay close. This podcast is a production of the Oatley Academy of Concept Art, Illustration, and Visual Storytelling. I'm Chris Oatley, your host and producer. Our editor is Kevin Chandler. Production support was provided by Travis Bond and Anya Marcos. Our theme music is provided by Storybook Steve. Recurring musical segments are provided by Storybook Steve and Kangaralian. We are a proud member of the Visual Voice Podcasting Network, and you can find all of our available shows at chrisoatley.com forward slash shows. Definitely been a transformational uh, event in my life, um, and... Uh, will probably continue to be. So it's, yeah, that's really exciting. Oh, it's, it is. Oh, I love it so much. Uh, great things happening at the Oatley Academy left and right. I feel like we're just, you just breakthrough stories. Uh, like there's like one or two a week now we're here. I think the big takeaway from mine is that me and Robert Downey Jr. are besties now. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, important I mean, that we get that on record. Yeah. We hang out like all the time. <laughs> like He's a fiend for enchiladas. You'd never guess it, but you know. <laughs> Me, me and RDJ, best bros. Enchilada bros. That sounds like a movie pitch. <laughs>